welcome you to worship for this 4th of July weekend. Uh, we come together always on the 4th of July with the men singing uh, one of our patriotic songs. This year they'll be singing, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, and uh, we hope that you will enjoy that. As, as we focus for worship today, I invite you to consider some of the things from the, the scriptures for the day. Uh, where the mystery of God is, God's way is sometimes hidden from the wise and the intelligent. Jesus' associates were those often excluded from the religious community. And so uh, we speak to that group. And like Paul, we struggle with our own selfish desires. We seek God's mercy. We seek God's forgiveness. Uh, we need that every day. So we gather today to be refreshed by Christ's invitation to come. Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy burdened. And so we gather to receive his yoke of freedom and joy and wonder. Uh, and we receive the gift of his love, both in water and in the word, um, in the gift of our worship together. And lastly, though we're not reading it today, our suggested Old Testament lesson comes from uh, the Old Testament book of Zechariah. And there's a phrase in there, I think really appropriate for this weekend of Independence Day. What does it mean, Zechariah asks, to be prisoners of hope? The prophet Zechariah used that term to describe the people of Israel who had suffered in exile but now return back to Jerusalem. And the question is, will they be able to see the vision of God's intended restoration? Uh, and are they willing to take action to bring about God's kingdom? And I think we've been in exile a long time around uh, pandemic issues, and we are preparing once again to gather for worship, even though it's outdoors soon. Uh, we need to look at that and ask ourselves, what does it mean for us to not be prisoners of a COVID virus, but to be prisoners of hope in the love of Jesus? So welcome to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. God is here. Let's celebrate. And let us pour out our lives in perpetual celebration over God's goodness and greatness. Let us announce to the world God's presence and proclaim his loving concern for his people. How compassionate God is over all he has created and how tender Toward his failure fraught creatures. God will not walk out on his promises to us, and those blessings are not reserved only for those who fit obediently into his design for them. God is just and forgiving. He gently picks up those who have fallen and restores them as part of his kingdom. God sustains those who are wavering in weakness and grants them grace and strength. God reaches into the void of empty lives to enrich and fulfill their hungry hearts. God is near enough to hear our every cry, to sense our every need, to grant us whatever is necessary, and to make us happy and productive as we seek to both follow and serve him. How incomparably glorious is our great God. May our mouths articulate and lives demonstrate the Holy One's ever-present love for all creation. Let us celebrate the eternal mercy and goodness of our God. Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call on you, know you, and serve you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Romans, the seventh chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. I'm reading from the message today. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I am not. Isn't that also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself, after all. I spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that one day I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, 
it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I really don't do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I am at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He, acts, he acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Here ends the reading. Hi kids, yesterday we celebrated Independence Day and that is our country's birthday. So today I have with me the American flag. This is the flag of the United States. As you know, our flag is red, white, and blue. But have you ever stopped to think about what those colors mean? The red stands for courage. Many men and women have had the courage to stand up and fight for our country. They've defended our country against our enemies and many have died in serving our country. And the white stands for purity. Purity means to do what is right. We hope and pray that our country will always stand for what is right. And the blue stands for justice. When we pledge allegiance to the flag, we end with the words, with liberty and justice for all. And that means that in our country, everyone should be treated fairly and with respect. The colors red, white, and blue remind me of our country, but those colors also remind me of Jesus. Red reminds me of Jesus' blood that was shed when he died on the cross for my sins. And that is very important because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. White reminds me that when I give my heart to Jesus, he washes me and I become clean, as white as snow. And the Bible says, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blue reminds me of God's faithfulness. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and make us clean. God is faithful to keep his promises. Yes, we have a lot of freedom, but the greatest freedom that we have is the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that the penalty for sin is death, but you and I have been set free from this penalty. We have been set free because Jesus paid the penalty. The Bible tells us that Jesus died to set us free from the penalty of sin. Instead of death, we have been given eternal life. This freedom wasn't free. Jesus paid that price for us. This week, as we had celebrated our Independence Day, we, re we needed to remember to stop and thank God for those who have paid the price for our freedom. And we need to do that even after Independence Day. It's very important. But even more important, let us remember to thank God for Jesus who has set us free from the penalty for sin because he was willing to pay the price. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in our country. We are thankful for those who paid the price for that freedom. But even more important, we thank you for the freedom we have because Jesus was willing to pay the penalty for our sins. In your name we pray, amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy, heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I invite you today on this Independent Day weekend to consider with me the question, what does it mean to be prisoners of hope? It is taken from that book, uh, of Zechariah, where the prophet invites the people of God as they return from suffering and exile to finally come home and to consider again what it means to be God's people living out the kingdom of God at work in the world. To be a prisoner of hope. But how do we tie that with our lessons for today? I was thinking about that as we consider all the options that are going on around us. What does it mean to live with a pandemic? What does it mean to struggle to make decisions to reopen again as safely as possible as we watch the numbers rise across our nation and people questioning what is truth in the midst of all of that? So I thought I'd begin today by asking you simply, what do you think is the most difficult word in the English language? There's a whole lot to choose from. Lacrimos, causing tears or being tearful. Contumacuous, insubordinate, rebellious. There are words here I can't even say. Uh, one that's got to be over 30 letters long. One of the longest words in the English language. But if I were to choose today, what is the most difficult word in the English language what I would suggest to you is it's also one of the shortest, one of the easiest to spell, one of the most common words that we know. It is simply the word N-O. No. I remember watching when our children were small as they first learned that difficult word, no. No, you can't play with the electrical socket. No, you can't run ahead of us out into the street. No, you can't take that toy from your sister. No, you can't play with the knobs on the stove. No. No, we don't like it. We don't like it because, well, it's negative. But even more, it's because it stands in our way toward what we want our wishes, our desires. And you know what? Those same children that I worked with, telling, teaching them no as children, they have grown and gone, their parents themselves. And now we deal with their children, our grandchildren, who also, truth be told, struggle with the same word, just as Kathy and I do, just as aunts and uncles, grandparents do, we all do, I would wager. Every one of us, part of the larger human family, well, we want, well, we want what we want for a reason. And no always runs contrary to those reasons and wants and desires. And at the same time as we mature, I hope we learn the value of that word, no not just for, our, for others, but even for ourselves. By saying no to that extra helping of dinner, we stay healthier. By saying no to television before studying for an exam, we hopefully get a better mark. 
by saying no to a rather uh, questionable tax exemption, we retain a greater sense of honor and we contribute to public welfare. Every day we are asked to say no, and especially now in this time, we are asked to say no <laughs> to gathering in large groups in small places. We are asked to struggle with what does it mean to say yes to wearing masks, saying yes to social distancing. And I think that's what we have to understand. The two sides of the coin are, for greater freedom, we share a responsibility. To be able to say no allows us to be able to say yes to something else. And there always is going to be tension. I think that's what the Apostle Paul was wrestling with as he wrote in his letter to the Romans, the reading for this day. Paul was trying to say, we have a tendency to think of the law always negatively because we experience it as enforcing something we do not want. But for Paul, the primary purpose of the law was to urge us toward life, toward that which is healthful, life-giving, of true value. Even while we are being lured toward life, toward that which is uh, desires that seize those things and ultimately lead to our death. For Paul, there's always a tug of war going on between what's right and what's immediately gratifying. So it points also for our need for help, for encouragement, for forgiveness, and ultimately it points us toward our need for God. That's what these lessons are inviting us to think about. And I personally think that's an important message during this time where all across our nation people are struggling with saying yes and no to what, where, and the confusion of the messages we are hearing all over the place are making this increasingly difficult. And maybe we need to ask the question, how do we help each other say no in a culture that only wants to understand yes to what we want? How do we say no to children that get used to getting almost everything they want? I realize that none of us sets out to raise our children on a sense of entitlement, but we always want to give them something better than what we had and if there are no limits, then ultimately what have they learned? And so we struggle. And how do we say no to ourselves when a credit card, for example, makes it so incredibly easy to say yes to whatever we want, immediate gratification, as we watch our own credit limits growing sky high with greater and greater debt becoming the outcome? And how do we say no to ourselves as a nation when on a weekend we, we lift up and celebrate freedom and independence, but at what cost? Where currently at this time, just last night, we crossed 50,000 cases in one day of COVID virus. Where hospitalizations are going higher and higher and death rates are getting higher more than 130,000 dead in the last few months. Do you realize that in the United States, we currently, if you look across the globe, we make up 30% of all the deaths from the COVID virus, while the United States makes up only 6% of the world global population. That doesn't make me proud of our independence. It makes me question how are we willing to come together as prisoners of hope for one another to make the best choices that will help all people? That's what this is all about. It's not about one political rhetoric being better than another. It's not about one party over another. It's about us as a people coming together for the good of all. 
not just in our nation, but for the world. Some might want to say that while those discussions are built, better held outside at our homes or outside in other places than at church. And yet I think Paul, the Apostle Paul would say it precisely belongs right here in this place. We are to be re reminded by scriptures, by Paul, that saying no is always difficult that it runs against our nature, that it always requires help. And Paul reminds us that saying no is always a prerequisite to being able to say yes. You can't say yes to being in relationship with one person without saying no to some others. You can't say yes to one particular dream without saying no to some of the others that get in the way. And so we say yes to God, yes to mercy, yes to grace. We say yes to a God who stands ready to forgive and to love and to encourage us and to help us along the way. So here's a story that I found. I find it fascinating. It's an old Aesop's fable about a horse and a donkey where according to the story, the donkey carried all of his master's burdens, even though he was very old and weak, while the horse simply walked alongside without, even, without a single thing on his back. Weakly, the donkey said one day, if you'll share this burden, I might just live, but without any help, I will surely die. And the horse shook his head and said disdainfully, well, keep moving, don't bother me. So the donkey walked along in silence until not long after he fell down dead. So the farmer transferred the whole burden of the, to the horse's back along with the dead donkey's valuable skin and the horse simply groaned, what a mistake I've made if I'd only agreed to carry part of the burden. But now I have to carry the whole thing. So sharing a burden together makes more sense but only if we realize that part of the burden is ours in the first place. That in our individualistic society, we often think we are responsible for ourselves and nobody else. Probably that's nothing new. After all, Cain did ask God if he was really expected to be his brother's keeper. We need to recognize that we all have a stake in each other's lives as part of the reason that happened at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, where Benjamin Franklin said simply, we must all hang together or assuredly we'll, we will all hang separately. But not everyone sees the world that way. For some, burdens are for other people and they are willing to set up burdens and barriers for others, sometimes perhaps even out of spite. But not for Paul. For Paul, he speaks the truth, that we are both beautiful and broken, we are made in God's divine image, but enslaved to something that actively wars against our efforts to be good and even to do good. And what Paul longs to do always is to point us back to the one called Jesus. That we need a Jesus to be more than just a good role model or a life coach or a mentor. That we need Jesus to save us. To break into this world of ours and this power that dominates us and set us free. Nadia Boltz Weber, Lutheran pastor and speaker, put it this way, no one is climbing a spiritual ladder. We don't continually improve until we are so spiritual we no longer need God. Instead, we die and we are made new. And that's different from spiritual self-improvement. We are simultaneously saint and sinner, 100% both all at the same time. 
And so in our gospel reading today, Jesus describes children sitting in the marketplaces, calling to each other with songs that no one frankly understands. When they sing a happy song, no one dances. When they play dirges, no one mourns. And yet Jesus comes along. He comes along to stand beside us, to help, to love, to support us, and to set us free. In other words, when we are left to fend for ourselves, we routinely miss what really matters. We don't know when to dance or when to mourn, when to repent, when to celebrate. We claim to be wise and discerning, but we don't even recognize the divine when we encounter it. God is either always too much or too little for us, too severe or too generous, too demanding or even too provocative. On our own, we have little capacity to discern what is good and right, holy and true. When I want to do good, Paul writes, evil always lies close at hand. So what hope do we have? Who will rescue us from these bodies of death Well, Jesus concludes his parable of the children in the marketplace with some of the most comforting words in all of the New Testament. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we need to notice the offer of a lighter burden is not extended to the powerful and those who are self-sufficient. Instead, it is offered to the weary and to the burdened. And I think in light of all that's been going on in recent days, we are feeling the weight of that heaviness and that burden. And so it is Jesus comes to us today. To those who recognize that they just can't make it on their own, no matter how hard they try. It's offered to those who, just like Paul, long to be delivered from forces too terrible to manage. Jesus comes to set us free. To give us a new freedom in Christ Not freedom from the world, but a place where we are no longer prisoners to a COVID virus, but we are instead prisoners of hope in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I hope we'll remember that and be willing to say no to some of the challenges of this world and yes to the love of Jesus, where we are prisoners to the hope he brings. Amen. Please join with me in our profession of faith and what it means for us to be prisoners of hope in Christ Jesus. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, since our cup runs over with the gifts of God's grace, we invite you to respond with your love and your lives, even as you share your gifts. And today, as we share our gifts during the offering, our Trinity men will be singing, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
Let us pray. O God, we thank you that Christ has entrusted us with the task of feeding your people. Make us faithful and courageous in our ministry of love, and may we use these gifts always to your glory. Amen. I invite you then to join with me in the prayers of the people, the prayers for this day. And our response is, hear us, O God, and you respond, your mercy is great. Called into unity with one another and the whole of creation, let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. We pray especially today for the leaders of Elog in Guatemala and especially for the people of the congregation Jesus El Buen Pastor, the, the Church of the Good Shepherd in San Antonio, Guatemala. Keep our partnership strong and free us from the stagnant faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us towards sustainable living. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for the nations of the world. Especially we pray for the United States for this weekend as we celebrate our freedom and independence. Guide our leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building and lead us to expansive love for our neighbor. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for all who are in need, for all who are tired, feeling despair, sick, or oppressed. We pray especially for those in our congregation hurting and in need of your healing touch. We lift to you today Joni Matson, Joe Mallory, Ron Guilfoyle, Mary Nelson. We ask you also to be with Jim Koenig, Linda Popa, Daryl Dickinson, Linda Curtis, and Marilyn Held. May they all know the gift of your healing touch. Take their yoke upon you, ease their burdens, and give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us bound. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for this congregation. Bless pastors and deacons, congregational leaders, energize our children and youth ministries, and all the volunteers, be with our church administrators and those who maintain our building, shine in this place that we might notice the ways your love continues to transform our lives. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. And we give thanks for those who have died in faith we pray especially today in remembrance of Marlis Nordgren and Robert Ulbricht, the son of Donna and Don. Welcome them into your eternal rest and comfort us in our grief until we are joined with them in new life. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. So receive these prayers, O oh God, and those that are simply too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join with me as together we pray the prayer Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our benediction for this day, neither death nor life, not angels or rulers, not things present nor things to come, not powers nor height or depth or anything else in all of creation, none of that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so now may God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in God's eternal love. Amen. You are the body of Christ. You are sent forth for the world. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God.